Thank you for joining us today for GitLab's second quarter of fiscal year 2024 financial results presentation. GitLab's co-founder and CEO, Sid Sabrandi, and GitLab's chief financial officer, Brian Robbins, will provide commentary on the quarter and fiscal year. Please note, we will be opening up the call for panelists' questions. To ask a question, please use the chat feature and post your question directly to IR questions using the drop-down menu. Before we begin, I'll cover the safe harbor statement. During this conference call, we may make forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These statements involve assumptions and are subject to known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from those discussed or anticipated. For a complete discussion of risk associated with these forward-looking statements in our business, please refer to our earnings release distributed today in our SEC filings, including our most recent quarterly report on Form 10-Q and our most recent annual report on Form 10-K. Our forward-looking statements are based upon information currently available to us. We caution you to not place undue reliance on forward-looking statements, and we undertake no duty or obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statement or to report any future events or circumstances or to reflect the occurrence of unanticipated events. We may also discuss financial performance measures that differ from comparable measures contained in our financial statements prepared in accordance with U.S. GAAP. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be a substitute for our GAAP results. A reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the most comparable GAAP financial measures is included in our earnings press release, which along with these reconciliations and additional supplemental information are available at ir.gitlab.com. A replay of today's call will also be posted on ir.gitlab.com. I will now turn the call over to GitLab's co-founder and chief executive officer, Sid Sibrandi. Thank you for joining us today. We delivered a strong quarter. Revenue grew 38% year over year, and we continue to demonstrate significant operating leverage in our model. We also reached a major milestone. Gardner and Forrester issued reports officially recognizing DevOps platforms. This is the category we created, and these reports validate the category's significance and importance. They also prove that the market is moving from point solutions to platforms. I'm thrilled with where these industry analysts placed GitLab within the category. We were named a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for DevOps platforms, and we scored the highest in our ability to execute of all the participants. And we were the only leader in the Forrester Wave integrated software delivery platforms. These reports show significant momentum for GitLab. They also reinforce a consistent team I hear. Customers want to develop better, faster, and more secure software, and they want to do more with less. I'd like to discuss three topics today. First, how we're innovating to create further differentiation for our DevSecOps platform. Second, how we're capturing the large DevSecOps opportunity with a strong go-to-market motion. And third, how we are continuing to drive responsible growth in the business. And Brian will cover this topic in even more detail. We held our GitLab 16 product launch event last quarter. We shared new features and capabilities of our AI-powered DevSecOps platform. We also discussed the roadmap for the coming year. GitLab is uniquely able to help companies overcome the complexity of developing software. One area on which we focused was compliance. Our DevSecOps platform helps compliance leaders set the right controls and governance frameworks. We shared several new compliance capabilities. These include centralized policy management, expanded reports and controls, and compliance dashboards. Another focus area was security. GitLab enables companies to strengthen their software supply chain security. Point solutions make it difficult for teams to ship software faster while maintaining strong security. In contrast, 
Our DevSecOps platform enables companies to shift their security practices left and do it earlier in the life cycle. It helps developers catch vulnerabilities earlier in the development process. Please let me provide a customer example. Better Cloud is a market-leading SaaS workflow automation platform. They turn to GitLab to secure their software supply chain. In Q2, they renewed their business with GitLab to consolidate their fragmented tool chain. And as a result, Better Cloud deprecated multiple security point solution providers. This strengthened their security posture while also enhancing automation and increasing developer satisfaction. GitLab enables customers to make their software more secure without sacrificing speed. This differentiated value proposition resonates across all verticals. One particular example is the public sector. Speed to mission is imperative in this vertical. GitLab customer Navy Black Pearl demonstrates this value proposition well. Navy Black Pearl is a DevSecOps service developed and managed by Sigma Events. This service creates mission applications for the US Department of Navy. Black Pearl uses GitLab to quickly create new applications and continuously modify code in response to evolving requirements and priorities. Using GitLab, Navy Black Pearl's teams have designed and created custom operational software environments within days rather than months. Many of our customers have complex security compliance and regulatory requirements. We address these needs with GitLab Dedicated. This is a single tenant SaaS offering that became generally available in Q2. With GitLab Dedicated, we fully managed and deployed the DevSecOps platform. And this enables customers to save on operational costs. It also provides the control and compliance of a self-hosted solution. GitLab Dedicated offers full data and source code isolation, data residency, and private networking. Let me provide another customer example. One of the world's leading advisory and asset management firms choose GitLab Dedicated over GitHub in Q2. They had a SaaS-first initiative. Their security teams would not allow a multi-tenant SaaS solution. They choose us because GitLab Dedicated met their security and compliance requirements. GitLab Dedicated also enabled this customer to accomplish other objectives. These include eliminating duplicate tools, increasing operational efficiency, and accelerating their move to the cloud. GitLab integrates all aspects of software development into the same platform. Customers can improve their productivity and efficiency across the entire life cycle. This includes enterprise agile planning and value stream management. In Q2, we expanded business with a multinational financial services company. The customer wanted to drive greater efficiency by integrating an enterprise agile planning solution with the rest of their software development practices. They moved thousands of business users from Jira to GitLab. AI continues to be a key area of product innovation. We are developing AI-powered capabilities across the entire software development lifecycle. Let me share just a few of these capabilities. Code Suggestions uses generative AI to suggest code to developers. Suggestion Reviewers leverages AI to identify the most appropriate reviewers of code. Explain This Vulnerability provides details about potential security vulnerabilities in code. And Code Suggestions remains on track to be generally available later this year. We differentiate our approach to AI in several ways. We have a commitment to privacy and transparency in our use of AI. We also deliver AI throughout the entire software development lifecycle. Today, we released the findings of our State of DevSecOps study. This study illustrates the importance of our AI differentiation even further. In June 2023, we surveyed more than 1,000 respondents. These include individual contributors and leaders in software development, IT operations, and security. We found that 79% of respondents are concerned about AI tools accessing private information or intellectual property. We also found that developers only spend 25% of their time writing code. 
And that's why we believe delivering AI beyond just code suggestions is essential. The second topic I want to discuss is how we intend to capture the large DevSecOps market opportunity with a strong go-to-market motion. Strategic partnerships are an important part of our go-to-market execution. And I would like to highlight Google Cloud and AWS as two of the most significant. GitLab and Google Cloud are strongly committed to delivering secure enterprise AI offerings across the software development lifecycle. We are thrilled to be working with Google Cloud on delivering our vision of AI-powered workflows. We are leveraging Palm 2 foundational models, including the new Kodi model family, to deliver new AI-powered experiences to all users involved in creating secure software. Our partnership with Google extends even further. At this year's Google Cloud Next, we announced our plans to integrate GitLab into the Google Cloud Console. GitLab also received the 2023 Google Cloud Partner of the Year Award for the third consecutive year. Google recognized GitLab for our achievements in application development within the Google Cloud ecosystem. Another key partner is AWS. In Q2, AWS introduced support for GitLab in AWS Code Pipeline. This is a fully managed continuous integration and continuous delivery service. This new AWS capability allows developers to leverage their GitLab.com source code repository to build, test, and deploy code changes with AWS Code Pipeline. Last quarter, we also embarked on our DevSecOps World Tour. We're taking GitLab on the road to 14 cities in four countries. These events bring together developers, security, and operations technology leaders. They can learn how organizations use GitLab to build more secure software faster. We're happy to feature many partner and customer speakers. Examples include Delta Airlines, Lendlease, and Cisco. In Q2, we announced the appointment of Chris Weber as our Chief Revenue Officer. Chris brings more than 20 years of sales leadership experience from Microsoft. This includes building multi-billion dollar sales organizations. Chris's customer-first approach will be instrumental as GitLab scales in our next phase of growth. In closing, I'm pleased with our second quarter results. They demonstrate continued momentum and solidify our category leadership. With our recent analyst and customer validation, we are well positioned to win in the estimated $40 billion market opportunity. I'd like to thank our customers for trusting GitLab. And I'd also like to thank our team members, partners, and the wider GitLab community for their contributions this quarter. I'll now turn it over to Brian Robbins, GitLab's Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Sid. And thank you again for everyone joining us today. I'm very happy with our key metrics in Q2 and that our revenue grew 38% year over year. I'd like to emphasize Sid's point about driving responsible growth as we achieved over 2,300 basis points of non-GAAP operating margin expansion. We continue to find ways to become more efficient while scaling the business to address our large market opportunity. We also continue to make target investments in key product areas. These include security, compliance, AI, and agile planning. Part of our responsible growth strategy is to continue to optimize our pricing and packaging. In April of this year, we raised the price of our premium SKU for the first time in five years. Over that time frame, we added over 400 new features. We believe this better aligns price with value for our customers and the investment we made over the past five years. In the first four months post-launch, customer behavior was in line with our expectations. As a reminder, we anticipate minimal impact to our financials from this change in the current year. We expect the price increase to have a much larger impact in FY25 and beyond. Looking back at the quarter, I want to touch on customer buying patterns, contraction, and ultimate trends. First, customer purchasing behavior in Q2 was consistent with Q1 of FY24. We believe buying patterns appear to have stabilized. Second, contraction was lower than Q1 of FY24 and appears to be stabilizing. Third, ultimate, our top tier, continues to see strong adoption driven by customer wins for security and compliance use cases. Now, turning to the numbers. Revenue of $139.6 million this quarter represents an increase of 38% organically from Q2 of the prior year. We ended Q2 with over 7,800 customers with ARR of at least 5,000. 
compared to over 7,400 customers in the first quarter of FY24. This compares to over 5,800 customers in Q2 of the prior year. This represents a year-over-year -year growth rate of approximately 33%. Currently, customers with greater than 5,000 in ARR represent approximately 95% of our total ARR. We also measure the performance and growth of our larger customers, who we define as those spending more than 100,000 in ARR with us. At the end of the second quarter of FY24, we had 810 customers with ARR of at least 100,000, compared to 760 customers in Q1 of FY24. This compares to 593 customers in the second quarter of FY23. This represents a year-over-year -year growth rate of approximately 37%. As many of you know, we do not believe calculated billings to be a good indicator of our business, given that our prior period comparisons can be impacted by a number of factors, most notably our history of large prepaid multi-year deals. This quarter, total RPO grew 37% year-over-year to $496 million. CRPO grew 34% to $335 million for the same time frame. We ended our second quarter with a net dollar base retention rate of 124%. As a reminder, this is a trailing 12-month metric that compares the expansion activity of customers over the last 12 months with that same cohort of customers during the prior 12-month period. The ultimate tier continues to be our fastest growing tier, representing 42% of ARR for the second quarter of FY24, compared with 39% of ARR in the second quarter of FY23. Non-GAAP gross margins were 91% of the quarter, which is consistent with the preceding quarter. This is a slight improvement from second quarter of FY23. SAS represents over 25% of ARR. We have been able to maintain best-in-class non-GAAP gross margins despite the higher costs of SAS delivery. This is another example of how we continue to drive efficiencies in the business. We saw improved operating leverage this quarter, largely driven by realizing greater efficiencies as we continue to scale the business. Non-GAAP operating loss of $4.3 million or negative 3% of revenue compared to a loss of $27 million or negative 27% of revenue in 2Q of last year. This includes an operating loss of $3.2 million for Jihu, our JV and majority-owned subsidiary. On a standalone GitLab basis, the operating loss was $1.1 million. We generated a positive operating cash flow of $27.1 million in the second quarter of FY24, compared to a $36.3 million use of cash and operating activities in the same quarter of last year. Now let's turn to guidance. We're assuming that the trends in the business we have seen over the last few quarters continue. There has been no change to our overall guidance velocity. For the third quarter of FY24, we expect total revenue of 140 million to 141 million, representing a growth rate of 24 to 25% year over year. We expect a non-GAAP operating loss of 6 million to 5 million, and we expect a non-GAAP net loss per share of 2 cents to 1 cents assuming 155 million weighted average shares outstanding. For the full year FY24, we now expect total revenue of 555 million to 557 million, representing a growth rate of approximately 31% year over year. We expect a non-GAAP operating loss of 33 million to 30 million, and we expect non-GAAP net loss per share of eight cents to five cents, assuming 154 million weighted average shares outstanding. Excluding the impact of Jihu, it's likely that GitLab will reach break-even on a non-GAAP operating income basis in third quarter of FY24. On a percentage basis, our new annual FY24 guidance implies a non-GAAP operating improvement of approximately 1,500 basis points year-over-year -year at the midpoint of our guidance. We believe that our continued focus on responsible growth will yield further improvements in our unit economics. We remain on track to achieve free cash flow break-even for FY25. There are a number of drivers we are introducing that we believe should help fuel our business in FY25. I touched on the first one earlier, which is the price increase in our premium tier. Additionally, in Q2, we started enforcing user limits on our free SaaS tier. It's early, but we have seen additional free users upgrade to premium. A third driver is the launch of Dedicated. This allows us to address a new opportunity for companies with complex security and compliance requirements. Finally, we plan to monetize our AI capabilities by launching an add-on that will include code suggestions functionality later this year. Separately, I would like to provide an update on Jihu, our China joint venture. Our goal remains to deconsolidate Jihu. However, we cannot predict the likelihood or timing of when this may potentially occur. 
Thus, for modeling purposes for FY24, we now forecast approximately 25 million of expenses related to GHU compared with 19 million in FY23. In closing, I'm pleased with our continued business momentum. We believe the value proposition of our market-leading DevSecOps platform is resonating in the market. Looking forward, we continue to prioritize driving revenue growth in a responsible manner. With that, we'll now move to Q&A. To ask a question, please use the chat feature and post your questions directly to IR Questions. We're ready for the first question. Our first question comes from Sterling at Moffitt Nathanson. Hey guys, this is actually uh, Billy Fitzsimmons on, on for Sterling Audi. Uh, Sid, I, I, I gotta say you, you, you look great and, and I hope you're doing well. Um, in, in, in terms of the question, uh, Sid, for you, obviously a, a few months ago, the firm held a discussion with investors to talk through the generative AI-based uh, products. And then you gave us an update on, on Duo and, and AI and the prepared remarks, uh, but maybe double clicking and, and going a little deeper. And, and I gotta imagine we're, we're still in the early innings here. Uh, but, but curious if you could talk through kind of early customer feedback on these products, ad adoption trends, what you're hearing and, and seeing. And then if I could sink another one in, maybe, maybe for you, Brian, uh, obviously earlier this year, you announced a price increase and the way that's structured, a lot of that won't be felt in, until fiscal 2025 and 2026. Uh, but now that it's been several months, can, can you maybe give us an update on, on kind of what you're seeing and hearing from customers on the price increase, uh, retention trends and, and uh, stuff like that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and uh, the early feedback to Duo has been very positive. Customers get that they need AI features, not just for, for example, coding, but they need it throughout the DevOps lifecycle. And uh, we've uh, just published the report, actually, we're publishing it today, the state of DevOps. And even for developers, which is only kind of a third of a DevSecOps platform, only 25% of their time is spent coding. 75% of their time is elsewhere. So it's really important to have a set of features throughout the life cycle. We're really happy that we have 10 features out there already. And some of the, the oldest feature we have suggested mm -hmm. viewers has over 100,000 users today. So we're excited about progressing that further. And it's great to see that customers recognize that they need a suite of AI features and therefore we're, we're excited about Duo. And on the price increase, um, last quarter when we had our call, we only had a month of data. So uh, happy to say we have three months of data this quarter. And um, you know, I'm happy with the results. Uh, it's been in line to slightly above our expectations. You know, As a reminder, we implemented the price increase because uh, we put 400 new features in the platform. And we wanted that to match the value that we were providing our customer. And so the guidance that we provided for this quarter, as well as a full year, uh, includes that impact. Um, when we went, through, when we announced the price increase, uh, we talked about just due to the radical nature of the revenue and renewals coming up through the year, there would be uh, very little impact in FY 2024, and the majority of the impact would come in FY 2025 with all the impact um, realized in the year of FY 2026. Perfect. Thank you both. Our next question comes from Michael at KeyBank. Hey guys, good evening. Um, from, a, from a macro perspective, uh, perhaps you could talk about where we are in, in terms of a couple factors. One, the, the pace of new application development, especially with cloud optimization seeming to slow, but still there, so application development, and then also developer seats and where we, from your perception, where we are relative to that as a driver for you. Yeah, I'm happy to go through the seats and then Sid, if you want to go through application development, uh, that'd be great. Um, just on the seats in general, you know, I would say that we see more stabilization in Q2 over Q1. Um, with that said, though, you know, the buying patterns of customers, um, you know, has changed, right? And we talked about this a number of different um, a number of different quarters, and people are buying for what they have currently hired today. And they're only buying for products that they um, have funded in the plan. And so, you know, we, we factor that into our guidance, the overall macro. And so that's included in our third quarter guidance as well, the full year guidance. If you can just repeat your question on the, um, you know, the application development for Sid, that'd be great. Sure. Sid, so the, the question was, 
to the extent that we've seen cloud optimization slowing, I think, but maybe not done. Um, where do you think we are in terms of the pace of application development in the cloud and how that is or isn't helping to drive your business? Yeah, I, I think that cloud optimization has uh, been a lot of kind of consumption patterns that were hit. I think we were less, much less impacted by that. We do uh, have seen the decline of kind of the expansion of, of kind of hiring more developers and, and things like that. I think that's uh, been a headwind for us. And I think as far as moving application development to the cloud, I think we still have a long way to go. We regularly uh, partner with uh, big companies and they still have a lot of things that need to move to modern practices. Uh, a lot of things are still not DevOps, they're still not cloud native. So there's still a big shift ahead of us. I'll leave it at that. Those are sort of two questions. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michael. Next, we have Joel from Truist. Um, thank you for taking my question. Hey, Brian, one for you. Um, just um, great job on the operating leverage side. Just wanted to understand, you know, puts and takes in, in 3Q and the rest of the year on that operating margin line, uh, notwithstanding GHU, which I know, um, you know, is going to hopefully be deconsolidated at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Joel, for the question. You know, Sid and I have been very consistent in our messaging before we went public and every quarter since going public that our number one goal was to grow, but we'll do that responsibly. And I'm super happy with the increased operating leverage that we continue to get in the business. Um, this was a big milestone for GitLab this quarter. We achieved a non-gap EPS of positive one cents. And so every other quarter, we've actually lost money. Um, in Q2, just to show the operating leverage, uh, we delivered approximately $30 million, $39 million of incremental revenue over 2Q of last year. And we did that with $16 million of additional expense. If you look at first half of this year versus first half of, of last year, we've delivered approximately $130 million of revenue with only $70 million of additional expense. And both of those were adjusted for GHU. Um, in my prepared remarks, I did say it's likely that we'll reach non-GAAP operating income positive in 3Q. And then we also reconfirmed and committed to being free cash flow positive in FY25. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to Rob from Piper Sandler. Great. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Brian, just want to touch on the macro a little bit more. Appreciate the, the commentary and noting that NRR contracted again uh, a little bit sequentially. So any guideposts you can put or, or rails around where that might go. I think you gave us um, you know, a lot of indications around stabilization with behavior being consistent, some of the other metrics that, that you threw out. So just want to understand maybe where that NRR uh, might bottom. And then for Sid, as you talk a little bit about the, the SaaS offering, noting it's still only 25% of um, your ARR, Maybe help us understand what some of those key features might be that'll that'll drive more incremental SaaS demand. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the NRR question first and turn it over to Sid to uh, answer your uh, second question. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we did see some stabilization in Q2 over Q1. Um, you know, customers are still buying what they need. And so the fact that, you know, last year they're buying a lot more and this year they're just buying what they need. Um, is why you're seeing a slight drop in the net dollar retention rate. Um, I am happy to say that every year since we've launched uh, is still expanding. And so customers are still buying more year over year than what they've bought historically. Um, you know, when you look at sort of, I've talked about historically that, um, you know, the watch point in the business was around contraction. And that was primarily um, contraction expansion primarily in our premium seats. I'm happy this quarter we actually had a very um, good expansion quarter. Um, contraction has leveled out and churn has always been much smaller. Um, but you know both of those are reflected in the guidance going forward. We didn't give out sort of what a target number is or where we think it bottom out. If you look in the business though, um, you know, contraction started late in four, fourth quarter of last year. And so we're about three quarters into this, you know, average contract length is, you know, a little over 14 months. So I expect we have, you know, another quarter, quarter and a half to go until we work through the cycle of the new buying patterns. Great. 
Thanks for that question, <laughs> Rob. I understood it as like, what's going to drive self-managed revenue to SaaS revenue? And I see two big things. I see dedicated, our new offering, which is single-tenant SaaS. We have gitlab.com, which is multi-tenant SaaS, but to address the most complex compliance requirements, we're super excited about this new offering. And it's a great way to get our biggest uh, customers with the most complex requirements up to a SaaS platform where we maintain it for them. Another driver of the move to SaaS can be uh, additional functionality for self-managed. Uh, we call this GitLab Plus. And for example, some of the AI features will require a connection to uh, GitLab SaaS in order to consume them. So uh, there's, there's more features that we've uh, thought about, but not yet launched. But additional features to kind of get a kind of a hybrid installation. Some of it is on-prem. Some of the new features are SaaS provided in the cloud and kind of gradually move those customers over. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Next, we have Koji from Bank of America. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the question. I wanted to ask about the analyzed category. Uh, when, when I looked at the investor presentation, it looks like this is a new category on the product page in the investor deck. And I really wanted to focus on you know, the metrics, logging and tracing. And I guess, could you categorize what type or maybe category of vendor would you be competing with with this product? And, and why would a customer go with GitLab for metrics, logging and traces versus maybe some of the other traditional vendors in that category? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. So specifically the metrics logging and tracing, I think that's called the APM uh, category, application performance management and popular vendors there are vendors like Datadog and New Relic. So over time, we'll be competing with them. But in the beginning, we'll start our, the features really basic with just very early functionality. So we're not as much competing with the big vendors. We're competing with non-consumption. The alternative to GitLab would be just not setting up logging and metrics and things like that, because the features we'll offer in the beginning is really are really basic. But because of our open core model where our customers can contribute, over time, they will start contributing. Our last monthly release, GitLab 16.3 in August, it had 237 contributions from our customers across the platform. So over time, over many years, the functionality will improve. And the goal is to become best in class over time and, and compete with those best in class solutions. Just one follow-up, if I may, there, you mentioned APM. You know, just thinking a little bit further out, would there be any plans to maybe go into infrastructure monitoring or log analytics too? Thanks, thanks, Ed. Yeah, if we do logging, log analytics uh, makes sense to me as a, a category. If you look at infrastructure, we already have infrastructure as code functionality. For example, our ter Terraform uh, support. Uh, so certainly something that has our attention. Next, we move on to Derek from Cohen. Great, uh, thanks guys. Um, you, you've talked about vendor consolidation as a, as a key opportunity for GitLab for some time. Um, that theme has definitely popped up more across the software landscape since the macro hit over the last few quarters. Just wondering if that um, kind of cadence of business for you guys is picked up, if you have any metrics um, to share at all in terms of like the percentage of expansion business um, growing in terms of vendor displacement. Um, and then I, I have a quick follow-up. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll, I'll let Brian add to my uh, answer, but I think what we're seeing is that the market is starting to get it. And I think the introduction by Gartner and Forrester of this category of DevOps platform is gonna be a real tailwind for us because it signifies to customers like this is the future. If you look at our 2022 State of DevOps report, 69% of organizations said they wanted to consolidate tool chains, but they don't want to compromise on functionality. So as GitLab gets more complete and is able to take out more point solutions, that is an amazing uh, trend that the customers want to consolidate. Now the analysts are saying it, and we hope to go from kind of the early, early adopters to the early majority in that. Brian? Yeah, just to say a couple extra words uh, to what Sid said is, um, 
You know, absolutely. I think you know, we're seeing this sort of in the customer journey, if you will. And so they're landing on premium. Uh, they're landing relatively small. They're actually then expanding to division departments within the company, then ultimately upgrading to ultimate. And so, you know, the customer journey continues to show, uh, despite the macro, when you think that people wouldn't be selecting a new technology or a new platform, uh, this has really caused people to evaluate how they're developing software and exploring ways to, you know, make software better, faster, cheaper, and more secure. And so I think, uh, you know, what Sid said, as well as what we're seeing just from a customer perspective, you know, is we're continuing, is continuing to see the vendor consolidation. Great. And, and just to follow up is, um, you know, last quarter, you guys talked about more C-level involvement in uh, purchase decision making. Uh, just curious how you've uh, maybe tweaked the go-to-market to, you know, adopt to that environment, and especially in light of um, kind of a new uh, leadership in place and maybe what kind of tweaks you'd be looking in the second half of this year. Yeah, we we don't have any major disruptions planned. It's been a very seamless transition in our go-to market, but we are focused on those C-level buyers. And one thing we do is a value stream assessment where we go into the customer, map all their existing tools and kind of how we can gradually replace that so that it's not a big bang, but they they get it as renewals come up as they as we solve their biggest problems. And their biggest problems can be like, my Jenkins installation can be upgraded and it's a problem or I'm behind on security. So I need an integrated set of security tools or I have the security tools, but the compliance is there. I can prove that I've done things. So depending on what their needs are, uh, we, we make a plan with them and that frequently goes up to the highest level in the organization. Typically middle management is engaged with kind of keeping their DIY solution uh, up in the uh, kind of up and running. So it's important for us to talk to those decision makers in the top. Perfect. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to Carl at UBS. Okay, great. Maybe I'll ask one for Brian and one for Sid. So, um, Brian, on the 3Q revenue guide of uh, 141 million at the high end, that's only up a smidge from your actual and 2Q. It's typically up double digit on a percentage basis. So, I wanted to ask, was there anything that felt a little one-time-ish in 2Q or that's on your mind in 3Q that you'd like to call out? And then I'll maybe I'll follow up with Sid. Yeah, thanks for that, Carl. There's, there was nothing, there was, if you look at 2Q revenue and go through, there was nothing that was anomalous sick in the revenue. I would just say, you know, 2Q is an actual and 3Q is guidance. Yep, okay, makes sense. Hey, Sid, you, uh, you called out a a JIRA displacement in a large multinational bank. Um, you don't often hear that. And I think you and Brian have often said over the last couple of years that, you know, it's very early stage for GitLab to be displacing JIRA software. Is there a, is there a change in that uh, cadence? Well, we're getting closer now. Uh, this was a proof point for us. The, the customer, as far as I know, is very happy with the change. Um, so, um, we've gone from this just being something we hoped for to something that's happening. And what's happening is that people are moving from point solutions to a platform because you can get the cycle time up. And our enterprise portfolio management is good enough to replace Jira in many instances. Companies are also going from having like very complex work streams in Jira that needs lots of human sign-offs to automating more. For example, all those security scans or compliance management that, for example, you can enforce that every piece of code is reviewed by two people. Instead of signing off and checkboxing in JIRA with people, you can all automate that. And that's what also enabling us to do that. Okay. Congrats on the good results. Thanks, Carl. Next, we have Matt from RBC. Great, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Sid, um, uh, you look great, too. So that's uh, it's really good to see that as well. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about, uh, I think, Brian, your comment was customer behavior on the premium price increase was in line with expectations. I just wanted to double click on that a bit. You know, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're just they're effectively taking the price increase? Are you seeing any? I know it's not a factor, but typically that you've talked about, but are any moving to ultimate? Just maybe a little bit more color on what in line with your expectations means. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. When we when we did the uh, price increase, we did an internal model that looked at 
you know, bookings, churn, and we came up with what we thought our forecast would be on, you know, the overall net bookings. And so I, I would say overall bookings is more positive than our internal forecast and churn is less. And so, you know, we're seeing, you know, positive signs on every element of how we, how we modeled it from a bookings and churn perspective. Got it. Thanks. And maybe just a quick follow up on dedicated. I believe last quarter, did you have, I think you had two customers, two large customers on dedicated. Um, I think Sid, maybe you mentioned that I, I don't, are, are, maybe just a little bit more color on, you know, the number of customers there, if you're giving that. And then I, you know, I know there's a hosting um, layer to that, but, but sort of like, what are you seeing from a customer spend perspective when they take dedicated? Yeah, I think we're happy with the pipeline for dedicated. Uh, right now you can only get dedicated if you, go for GitLab Ultimate, and there's a minimum number of seats. So um, the, the, the list has it that you need a thousand uh, seats to move to uh, dedicate it. And that's an attractive offering for like the bigger organizations. Uh, we're happy with the pipeline. There's There's been demand and that demand is coming for the people currently on self-managed. And what they like about this offering, it has the same kind of security as self-managed and that they're the only customer they're, they're completely separated. They can set it up in their VPC, but they don't have the operational burden. We make sure they're on the latest version and that everything runs. And we're the, we're the experts at GitLab and they don't no longer need those people internally dedicated to that. Got it. Thanks a lot, guys. Now we'll move to Ryan from Barclays. Thanks for the question. Uh, for Sid, for those customers who are evaluating adding large language model features to their DevOps platform today, are they still mostly focused on code suggestions or is there increasingly other considerations at play as these customers get smarter and more in the weeds on AI? Yeah, I think as customers get more sophisticated, they're seeing that AI should be throughout the life cycle. Um, as mentioned earlier in this call, like. It's DevSecOps, right? You need those AI customer features too to make security more efficient. If you just produce more code, that's not going to do it. And of those developers producing more code, that's not the only thing they, they need. So as customers get more sophisticated, they want more AI features. And we're really happy that we have 10 features out already. The second thing they want is good guarantees of privacy that they're intellectual property is never going to be used to enhance other people their uh their their platform their 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 feet their intellectual property so i think in both we have a, a really compelling story excellent now one for brian uh brian i know billings and crpa are not the perfect gauge of your business on a quarterly basis i'm um, just giving the lumpiness and longer term contracts but anything anything to think about um on those two metrics in the quarter just coming off a strong first quarter uh, you know, in, in 2Q, you know, when large enterprise clients, uh, you know, want to adopt the DevSecOps platform, they typically want to do multi-year deals. Um, we talked about historically where we don't compensate for that because we didn't want to drive that behavior with such a high gross retention rate. Um, but we did see a number of multi-year deals in 2Q. Um, I think it was said earlier, we had the largest deal in company history in 2Q. Uh, once again, you know, big multinational um, company, uh, just a, a demonstration of wanting to go to a DevSecOps platform and get you know, making a long-term commitment to GitLab. Appreciate the color. Thanks, guys. Now we'll move on to Mike from Nita. Hey, thanks for getting me on here, guys. Uh, I had I had two questions, and I'll I'll take them separately. But if I could first go to Brian. Um, I just wanted to make sure I'm kicking the tires here. I know you're, you're talking uh, in some of your comments to Matt that, hey, uh, net bookings are slightly more positive. Uh, churn is, is slightly below what you guys had forecast, which is great. But uh, to be clear, like, it, has there been any change as far as your assumption from this price increase to the guide? And can you remind us again, what, what is the benefit that you are including for this year's guidance when we think about um, the benefit from that price increase? Yeah. And I just have one follow up for Sid. Sorry. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, there's there's been, um, you know, it's included in our guidance. And, you know, when you walk through the ratable nature of the revenue, uh, it's it's very little impact uh, this year. So 
uh, where we are doing better than expected on the way that we've modeled it internally from a bookings and churn perspective. It doesn't have really any meaningful financial impact this year. We'll get the majority of the impact next year and then a little the following year. Got it. Got it. Thanks for that, Brian. And then for Sid, I, I just wanted to hash out. I know that we're all excited for the AI SKU launching later this year. Uh, a, a couple of questions here, but can you help us think about what's the expected timing? Is it more of a 3Q or a 4Q event? As well as I think when we've spoken about it today and, and last quarter as well, the main focus um, that we've heard externally is, is really around code suggestions. And I'm hoping if you could elaborate a little bit more on maybe some of the additional features or functionality that will be um, added to that SKU as well, or, or is there potential actually to have multiple uh, AI SKUs, almost like a good, better, best, or, or separate AI SKUs that you are thinking about rolling out to the market? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. So it's projected to be generally available later this year. We haven't made a decision between Q3 or Q4 yet. And it just this the skew just contains code suggestions. It's likely we'll also end up coming with a different queue that includes more of the AI features. Although some of the AI features might be included in the existing ultimate package. For example, suggested reviewers is all already available to people without paying separately for it. So it's probably gonna be a mix of those things. Perfect. Thank you. We now move to Jason at William Blair. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanted to ask about the user limits on the free tier. Um, Sid, you, I think you mentioned that, uh, or maybe Brian, you mentioned that. Um, I, I'm not super familiar with what you did there. Could you just remind us what happened and what the impact has been and what it could be? Sid, you want that? Do you want me to take it? I'll, I'll start off and you, you can add to my answer, but the, the user limits, uh, they don't apply to self-managed installations, but for people on GitLab.com using our free tier, we said, hey, if you have more than five users, you got to switch to a pay tier. And the reason for that is we have significant costs kind of hosting GitLab.com. Um, so we want it to be long-term sustainable. Um, it is leading to uh, good conversion although the majority of those conversions are below the $5,000 base customer cutoff. Brian, anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, the only thing I'll add on top of that, I think you covered most of it, was that um, you know the free-to-paid conversion is, is also built into our guidance. And you know once again, with the radical nature of revenue recognition, uh, the impact this year will be minimal. Great. And then a uh, quick follow-up, just uh, Brian, for you on the large deal, the largest in company history. Can you give us an idea of that size? And then also, um, how big is your largest customer? How much are they spending annually on ARR? Just so we can kind of um, gauge uh, what the opportunity would be with a lot of those 810, 100,000 customers, you know, 100,000 plus ARR customers where they could potentially get to. Yeah, so the largest deal uh, that we signed this past quarter was over $30 million. Uh, it was a multi-year deal. And then, you know, we have several customers approaching $10 million a year. Helpful, thanks. We'll now move to Pendulum at JP Morgan. Great day, guys. Uh, congrats on the quarter. I want to ask you on, on Ultimate, um, as existing premium customers kind of look to pay the higher price, are you seeing some of the conversion conversations lead to kind of upgrading to ultimate, especially as you educate people and, and flow in some of the AI capabilities as well, like suggested reviewers. Are, is those, are those conversations from premium customers looking to upgrade starting to happen more? Yeah, that whatever we expect is baked into our guidance, but we're seeing that, the, that it is a reason for people to reevaluate which tier am I gonna be on? And, and we're seeing uh, ultimate, being more and more uh, top of mind for people. Um, we haven't decided on the packaging of the AI features yet. So although AI is a significant part of the conversation, it's it's not driving ultimate per se because we're still uh, working on, on our packaging for the AI features. 
Got it. Uh, one for Brian. Um, Brian, anything to call out on the DR side? Seems like the sequential build, I think in Q2, was below that of Q1, which typically seems like does not happen, but wondering if there's anything to call out. Nothing specific. I mean, the Q2 total deferred revenue growth was 31% year over year. Um, you know, our RPO growth was 37% and our CRPO growth was about 34%. CRPO makes up approximately 68% of our total RPO. And so, um, you know, really pleased overall with the quarter. Understood, thank you. Our final question comes from Alan from Will Research. Hey guys, thank you for taking the question. So following the appointment of Chris Weber as CRO, can you guys just talk about what he's been focused on? Uh, what is he looking to implement to help the company scale in the next phase of growth? And how are you thinking about potential sales disruption for the year? Yeah, thanks for the question. So we're really excited to have Chris Weber on board. He's a very experienced sales executive. He's been responsible for multi-billion dollar sales organizations. And that's what we as a company want to go to. Um, hit the transition has been very seamless from our side. We spent a lot of time listening to our customers, listening to our sales team. Uh, there's no big changes in our go-to market. Uh, so um, very smooth and setting us up for success in the future. Understood. And just one quick follow-up. I noticed that you guys on your yearlies page had a target of about a million code suggestions users. And now it looks like it's kind of generally growing your base of code suggestions users as a goal. Could you guys just maybe talk about the change there and kind of in the background, if you guys look in the, you know, push more on the R&D side behind it before the launch, any kind of incremental color would be really helpful. Thanks. Yeah. So we're an extremely transparent company that publishes our OKRs, our yearlies, and we generally push people at GitLab to be extremely ambitious. For example, for our OKRs, we expect only 70% of our goals to be met. So especially in the beginning of our project, we, we set an ambitious goal. That's not something that was part of our investor communications or things like that. There's over There's a couple of thousand pages in the handbook. We appreciate people going through them but they're not part of our official investor communication. I wouldn't add any weight to that. And uh, this is a long game and we're taking a long-term view of this. Thank you, Sid. That concludes our 2Q FY24 earnings presentation. Thanks again once more for joining us and have a great day.